Today's session is a very exciting topic of space. Now, if you are anything like me, um, space always seems like it's a distant industry. It's, it's, it seems really intangible because it's not something that, that I personally experience on a day-to-day -day basis. But then I see uh, news from uh, SpaceX and I see a rocket going up and then it's all over Twitter uh, and then I get closer to it. And, you know, the industry has gone through some uh, ch changes from 1969 to, uh, to now. Um, you know, it was, used to be a government-led industry. Now there is more commercialization. And uh, who else could we bring on to uh, the, the session than Jörg Krissel? Now, Jörg has spent more than two decades in the space industry. Uh, he's been involved in the early stage of uh, space commercialization, sits on a number of committees, has uh, an engineering background, uh, and is going to uh, take us through the myths, unravel the, the, um, the myths of this industry, look at the outlook, uh, and get us to ask some questions around where this is heading. So uh, before I get into it, um, I'm going to ask you one question. And that question on the poll is, um, are you aware of space as a commercial industry and a potential focus? Do you think that there is commercial opportunity? Do you think we're too early? Um, do you think there's more hype than reality? Uh, what is your thinking as we go into uh, this webinar? Um, is it more fiction rather than fact? Uh, let's see what you think about this. So 69% of you think that it is a commercial industry and about 31% of you uh, I'm not so sure, but none of you said no. So uh, with that, Jörg, why don't we uh, have you to share your insights, take us through the outlook, the myths, and, and uncover some of the, uh, the, the facts. Yeah. Okay, yeah, thank you very much uh, for, the, for the intro. Um, yeah, first of all, hello to everybody. Um, yeah, my name is Jörg Berg Kreisel. I, uh, as, as, uh, as it was mentioned, I'm aerospace engineer by training. I started working in the industry in the 80s, in the late in second half of the 80s, and uh, so have seen a lot of things come and go, and then had the opportunity to also work from the other side as a, uh, as a, from a, venture, as a venture capital list uh, as an uh, investment manager of a fund and uh, in, during the 90s and since then, uh, since la the beginning of last decade, many things have changed. And uh, so the idea here is, and um, I want to take the opportunity to kind of give you sort of a fast track shortcut intro to what's happening because there's a lot of interesting and nice pictures out there and good reports, uh, but we don't have the time. We try to combine uh, the impossible, to do the impossible here to look at space as a sector, technologies, investment, outlook, and uh, all these types of things, which in principle is a tough thing to do, but uh, let's give it a try. In this series, as it was just introduced, my pleasure is to take you through this. So, space as an investment sector. This is not obvious at first, time, at first sight. Uh, for those people looking into it, yes, it is a topic for quite a while, but it has not yet arrived really in the broader investment community, contrary to rumors in the space industry. Okay, so I'm um, trying to give you a couple of ideas. So first of all, as it was just mentioned by the moderator in the introduction, space is an area or a field where most of us not, you kind of, we've heard about it, we know about uh, science fiction and enterprise, spaceship enterprise, Everybody certainly is aware of the shuttle and what came along with it all. And space to the public, in many cases, in many instances, is NASA, right? But space is much more than that. And in the meantime, has arrived in the uh, global economy. And with subsets of the space industry, actually the most part of the commercial space business, is really blended into business on Earth, into commercial terrestrial gross, gross market. And I will try to show you this. So what we see here, everybody knows space astronauts, or space flight, uh, science fiction, rockets. You need a rocket to get up there. You have satellites, space probes, spaceships and stuff. And of course, we know about these kind of long-term activities all the way to the colonization of the solar system and planets and so forth. Okay, so space. 
that is space. And now space, is it really, has it, is there an investment opportunity? Is there a way to look into space and to find good deals as we do as early stage tech investors? Does it make sense? Is it difficult? Why do other people do that? Billionaires do. Everybody has heard about Elon Musk also being in space. Uh, Bezos of Amazon is in space. Um, uh, Paul Allen of Microsoft has invested in space, et cetera, et cetera. So having said that, I want to kind of take, take you by the hand and just rush with you through the, the setup of the sector. And here is a very nice... Um, kind of breakdown by PricewaterhouseCoopers. And basically, what we, when we're looking at it, we, dis, we distinguish between primarily the upstream and the downstream. Okay? And there is a midstream, of course. And that's, uh, as you can see, uh, access to space, flying, launch service provision, that, of course, is obvious. That's a truck you need to get there. What you sent up there is the satellites or the systems and all this stuff which you put in space. And, um, and then you do this in terms of satellite applications, which is very known to many people, apart from science and the other things, commercial stuff, is satellite telecommunications, navigation, Earth observation, remote sensing, you name it, these type of things. And on the downstream side, you have sort of stuff everybody can understand, that's the, the, the back end of it. Uh, it's data providers, you have manufacturers of end-user equipment, these type of things, ship sets, et cetera, et cetera. And in the, mid, in the midstream, you have the sort of industry in between, which organizes managing data being generated in space and distributing them in whatever fashion on the planet, right? So, but there's much more, to, more than that. Then we have uh, space situational awareness type of thing, space exploration, humankind to explore the universe, to gain new knowledge, to go all the way to space resources, like uh, mining of asteroids and these type of things. That's far down the road. However, these are things which are getting closer and become more reachable for us. Okay, so that's a high level setup. Um, and then if you look into a kind of another breakdown of these type of things, um, and I don't want to, to, to confuse you too much, but basically here just upstream, downstream, and you see these various things. You have facilities for the launchers, you have suborbital vehicles, you have suborbital flies for space tourism, you have all the technologies to do these type of things. And you have the value-added services all the way to insurance program. So this may be a bit academic, but to, you might ask whether is there um, uh, any, uh, any companies out there where investors have invested? Yes, there are. And here is a breakdown by uh, the UK-based um, space fund, Seraphim. And uh, that's quite of an interesting setup. It's, there's different ways of doing that. I think this is very handy and kind of helpful. So you see in the upstream segment, you have hardware and you have materials and energy type related things, software engineering, uh, electronics, robotics, you have launchers, launch service providers, um, you have satellites uh, for Earth observation, telecoms, high internet of sync networks, these type of things. And then you have the segment in between with the drones and UAVs, which also leverage on spaceborne technology. On the right hand side, when we look at the downstream and break it down into the communications, ground terminals, storage, things, etc., etc., satellites, drones, you name it all the way to all this data, th data stuff on the bottom. So I think that's pretty nice. And if we then look at beyond Earth on the bottom here, you may imagine there's a number of things. So all those logos, and this is of course all in, 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 under constant change, um, have been backed by venture capital investors, all those companies, but there's many more. This is just a selection. And the industry is generating facts and figures. They are by far not complete yet, but we're getting there. I think all those guys doing these type of these type of things are doing a great job to educate and to evangelize the community. Um, here another thing by Sarah Fim. You look at the satellites up there, and that's what people may look into. But actually, look at the bottom, and that is what it's all about. You, you put such stuff in space to have sources where you put data through, or where you generate data. And with those data, you go down 
you need to build, launch, you etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But on the bottom, you 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 driving industries from finance, agriculture, cartography, energy, transport, government, construction, you name it. And there's plenty of applications. So it would, would take us too far if I would kind of uh, mention all those examples. So it's plenty of information out there. And uh, we will see uh, in a minute where money is being made as far as commercial revenues and markets in the sector. There's an interesting thing to be mentioned is that there was space in the old days driven by political decisions by R&D, by governments and, and kind of science projects and so forth. And then has slowly commercialized with satellite telecommunications to be the core of space commercialization for many, many years, which uh, generated 85% of the commercial revenues of the entire space industry um, up until around about uh, 10 years ago. And then things sort of slight, slightly changed. So and so now there is a new space sector where entrepreneurs build companies where the industry has advanced with technology, where new business models come into play, where space gets visibility and these type of things. And so, so we see a lot of things which are changing. So we have the Boeings, the Airbus companies, and uh, you name it, on the one hand side, and you have the SpaceX and, and thousands of small startups on the, on the right hand side in the new space economy and there's of course a lot of crossover between those and missions projects technologies being shared and uh, smaller companies building uh, serving big companies and vice versa the space economy and that is now we, i want to take you slowly down to the investment level the space economy is yet and that is a 2018 picture and the numbers take usually a while to, to be updated so we're talking these days at four four hundred billion dollar space economy to evolve to a trillion dollar economy uh, by 2040 okay uh, through many areas and here you see a bit of a breakdown um, of different uh, subsets of the market where general uh, revenues are being generated so you see there is a bulk of activities and uh, industry or business with the non-satellite industry. There is the satellite industry, uh, ground equipment, you name it. You have government budgets, you have non-US government budgets. So there's a lot of government business in there, but it is uh, launch service providers. And here is probably a surprise for you. See, building rockets and sending stuff up, it's a, small, a tiny little portion of the global space economy, isn't it? So you would probably imagine that rockets, that space business. No, it's a tiny little part. It's just the truck, it's a taxi, right, to do some stuff. So um, this is something, and you may uh, uh, keep in mind some of the names here. Bryce is a good source to look into at such information. So this really shows you it's a quite diversified industry. And here, to take this a bit further, is um, another breakdown how to look at these type of things. You see there is a growth, which you can see in the, in the industry over time, which for hardware related or kind of uh, 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 hardware and software and services related industry is quite good growth. And we distinguish between the satellite services, manufacturing, the launch industry and ground, ground equipment. There's plenty of things you need, all the way from antenna to end user equipment, these type of things. So you see, and within the satellite services, television is a big thing, and I bet uh, many of you guys uh, uh, receive uh, uh, satellite TV, right? So that is just another look at it. You see, there is an industry. There is an industry with markets and subsets and segments, and uh, it's, it's getting organized in a commercial sense, and that was not the case 20 years ago, by far not. So a lot of things changed last year, and actually, I would personally say, having observed this, uh, for 35 years now, um, being active in the sector. Um, now we're, being, we're getting organized and it's, it's quite prospering of the sector. So now space investment. Why is there space investment? Why does it make sense? Why do we have an enabling environment? Or what, what was good? So first of all, it started in the 90s with the consumerization of technology. Then we got the internet, power computing, you name the all these things. As for space in particular, miniaturization uh, is a big win and cheaper access to space. So launch costs have come down. What does that mean? It means like we can send more stuff for lesser money or we can do much more in space because stuff is being, has come down in size and weight and sending it up has become cheaper. So and that is just a little kind of slice 
uh, and cut out of all the advancements in the space industry. Now we have much more visibility, and that is a lot via the social media and the internet and these type of things. The industry is work moving from one of a kind and throwaway systems to serious manufacturing, all the way to servicing, right? So in an industrialization is in the main thing, and a lot of investors have entered the scene, and what I show you in a minute, you will not believe who's, who is investing. And that means, in summary, there is a number of commercial opportunities which have been there already 20 years ago, but now there's many more. So now there is a broad deal flow, still not easy, but you will see. So, and then just a snapshot, it's very complicated actually, but in the essence, it's just repeating the same things. Satellite manufacturing, national security, uh, B2B models, short-term plans, long-term plans, you know, it's, it's, it's quite of a diverse sector. So you need to see a number of things which you know or may have heard of, and you may think small side satellite constellations. And here's the message. Over a period of 10 years, that much money has been invested by rather known investors, some unknown, not so known, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, and we have outperformed this. So let's talk about 30 billion of investment in a 10-year time frame, because now the, in the 2020 numbers, you see some of them, it's even getting much more. And it is a steep rise in investment. So you see so many companies and satellites and launchers, etc., and you see the breakdown here, and it's quite interesting. So satellite companies uh, uh, account for the, for the most part of it. Here is a very nice animated graph, I think, uh, by, uh, put together by Space Engines Network, which summarizes the, um, um, the opportunities of investment. And um, so you see, that's, it's, it's a bit dated. In the suborbital domain, in the orbital domain, and in deep space, there's a number of companies which kind of raised a lot of money. And here I'm talking a bit new space, exploration, and all the stuff to come down the road. But you see there's a number of opportunities. And of course, as you see on the bottom left, the most of the money and most of the activity is yet taking place in the US, but it's changing significantly. And even that is a snap snapshot over time. So. For the last couple of years, and Bryce put together this quite nicely, you see a steep increase of investment into the sector per annum, uh, with venture capital leading it for the last 10, well, last six, seven years, right? So you don't have to go into the details, but it just shows you there's a steep rise. And why are people investing? These people are not stupid. It doesn't mean that all the deals would be good. Of course, you know that. But, and the sector doesn't generate as many deals per, per sector or per subset as other industries do. So that is a bit of a shortfall. So you need to know what you do when you invest, nevertheless. So that may surprise you. So here is a number of uh, companies, uh, investment groups on the left, the left two columns, and on the right two columns, you see who has invested there. Just walk down the names, Bessemer Ventures, DFJ, Founders Fund, Fresco, uh, you name it. Kosla Ventures, a number of things. You know, uh, I, I can only name a couple of them. Serafimov was called known in the sector. Promos Ventures, or before a data, data type of investor from, from, uh, from the US. So, and here is where they invest in, and what you can see, there's a lot of syndicated investment taking place. And these are just some sort of the big names because that is where the numbers really come together, whether we know. I have to admit that uh, this is partly misleading because, because it suggests that all the big names go into space. No, because some of the companies you see listed here, you may not know them, but many of them, at the end of the day, use a space system to do a data business on Earth. Okay, so that makes a difference. So they're using the space segment to do a big data business on Earth. So it's not space per se. And uh, here you see a uh, sort of, um, uh, of a number of s s visible space deals led by certain known venture capital investors all the way to Quoia, and you see more on the left, all the way to Kosla, right? And I think venture capitalists know all of those names. And you get kind of an idea what's happening. But these are just the big ones. Not talking about all business angels, not the smaller funds. None of them is listed here, okay? So many people are invested. And here is a quite, well, a quite nice uh, summary, which published actually a few days ago, this week, um, by Nosphere's Ventures. And uh, so it just shows you what happened in this quarter. 
And uh, so a number of, of, of investments have taken place. Anyway, having said that, how, shall we, how can we and shall we look at that? I told you, the space sector is uh, in infant stage with regards to deal flow and uh, having arrived uh, at the investment industry, early stage equity investment industry. Nevertheless, there is deal flow, but deal flow is not too much. And then you have to see, some stuff is just really cool in space, but we gotta be damn careful. Okay, because we see on the one hand side, we see uh, sort of not enough of deal flow for, for any type of special deals. On the other hand side, sometimes the stuff is just too good to be true, right? So we got to be damn careful with space. Uh, on the other hand side, the sector is maturing big time in terms of developing business acumen and the next generation leaders are really making it, right? And they're giving part of the old space industry a hard time. Here, a very important message. The sector at large has been organized and managed along technological and programmatic lines. Okay, space industry, space agencies, the science, all were organized along the same lines. Technology and programmatic lines. Launchers, structure, propulsion, satellite, subsystems, data link, these types of things. Okay, now when we look at the investment, we, we have to apply a different perspective. We, if we want to make an investment, we want to know what is the business nature of that company. As you know, what's the risk level, the, the common stuff. Market specifics, time frame, financing needs, system technology, you name it. And you know all that. But you need to understand that the space sector is still developing in the direction because it has not been set up. It had the processes and people, understanding and, and these kinds of things. We are not there yet. It's coming, but it's not there yet. So therefore, it's a pioneering, interesting time to invest there if you know what you're talking about, okay? So, and on the right-hand side, if we clustered a classified space-related investment communities along those parameters from business nature to system, as I wrote them down on the left, there can be more, then we see a totally different setup. It's not system technology, structure, these type of things. No, it is core space, upstream space tourism, Utilization of space like data or satellite application downstream ICT, diffusion of space technology, kind of space technology transfer into terrestrial economies, infusion of space technology, which is like spin-in technologies where terrestrial technologies can enhance space systems in this growing economy, or emotion type things, which is kind of anything around the emotion of space. We have space fashion shows, merchandising. You won't believe it. It's quite a business globally. Uh, you know, just look at the at the collectioner series of Lego. You know, it's making it's making a lot. So, here is then a summary, and here is the trick. If we take those things like core space, utilization, satellite applications, infusion, spin-in technologies, spin-off technology transfer, or these type of things, and sh and look at them in a in a multi-dimensional way, a kind of putting in a two-dimensional picture here. Is like we see in terms of the number of opportunities, the axis from the top right going down is we see a few up here and many down there. The financing needs, we see a little here and a lot of money which we need here. And the risk level is, the risk is very high on the left and the risk is low on the right. So putting all this together, suggests that core, core activities where you send stuff into space, where everything which you do upstream bears quite some risk, takes a lot of money. In the past, there were massive upfront investments uh, with long lead periods for, 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 for returns and these types of things. And there's not so many of those deals which we see, you know, compared to software uh, deals uh, you see in Silicon Valley, right? And on the lower right, you see, of course, that satellite application uh, downstream ICT is much more, we see many deals, we see thousands maybe, we see technology transfer deals with lesser, with lesser risk, etc. So the green behind basically says that is more the VC area and the super angels and the Elon Musk of this world is more on the upper left. However, it's not a black and white picture. There are great opportunities in upstream with regard and for smaller pockets with regards to subsystem components and supply chain, okay? 
because we're going into industrialization, mass manufacturing. So there is good stuff here, which then may, subsets of this may be down here on the left. Okay, so that's another thing. Anyway, um, now to kind of slowly close the loop and to find an end, taking you to a couple, through a couple of things. Did you know that Europe, for instance, and that's other stuff, we have the same for NASA and other things, does a lot of things to um, support, even with, with a lot of government money, all these activities, the politicians looking at it, all of those countries are setting up accelerators, et cetera, et cetera. So um, not going into the details of this, basically we see funding schemes from technology to kind of commercialization, from business concepts to et cetera, et cetera, where the European government sort of via, that's a picture uh, generated by the, uh, published by the European Investment Bank, so we see kind of joint efforts in promoting the space sector, not for the sake of security and sovereignty only, but also space contributes a lot to our daily lives and to the benefit of humankind, all the way from coastal monitoring, from pollution, from anything, Earth observation, kind of SAR technologies and uh, SAR systems and these things. Uh, search and rescue support and you name it, catastro uh, hazardous uh, stuff, catastrophes, all this kind of stuff is being supported by space. Not, last but not least, even the financial markets because one of the most important signals divided, generated by space is the time signal, which you, knew, you need for not many, many things here on Earth. Okay, so the European Space Agency, ESA, has uh, worked on space technology transfer since round about 1990 and in the meantime has set an incredible set up an incredible machine which as of today has nursed more than 1000 uh, space startups in europe and um so there is, is many many things uh, the numbers uh, some of the slides are not really known isa has a network of isa business incubation centers technology brokers and ambassadors across the continent and um so it's quite a supporting machine. And to give you an idea, and this is just for Germany, and the numbers are already dated. In the time frame of 2016 through 19, just one incubator of the European Space Agency in Bavaria and Germany um, brought in 230 million venture capital investments, not including another couple hundred million of investment by the, some of the companies in here. So that is, just, it, that is not even included. So this gives you an idea, if you flow down and go on the map and look at these various centers where you see where kind of entrepreneurs are being invited or space research to set up companies, um, a lot of money is being, general, uh, is being uh, kind of infused now to this from external parties, not only by the government. And here, just a couple of examples for, uh, um, for space technology transfer. Did you know that the Porsche discs, uh, 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 brake discs, uh, space technology? Came from space technology. So it's many things. I'm just showing this to you. And if you were to search NASA technology, space technology transfer examples, European space technology transfer examples, Japanese, etc., etc., you would not believe it, what it is. And here comes one important thing. You know that space technology transfer type of deals um, uh, and satellite application downstream ICT deals um, have lesser risk, require less money, and you see many, many more in terms of deal flow. What is the advantage of space technology? It's a superior technology by nature because it has to be lightweight, compact, uh, autonomous, durable, you name it. And the, the stuff which has flown to space, contrary to other high-tech, early-stage tech investments, the technology works and has been proven. So it's no more tech risk. It's about adopting the technology and commercializing it rather than with many other early stage tech deals maturing this technology. Technology works. That's a key differentiator. Um, so there is one company, for instance, provides a thunder, automated thunder zone no casting to air, air, aviation and to upper air, airspace control. And that is generated by a satellite with advanced atmospheric models. Nobody can do that, right? So these type of things. Uh, another example here, uh, precision technologies, um, that is uh, one of the winners of something. So I'm just showing you a couple pictures. So there is plenty, plenty in different centers of ESA, so and so many uh, entrepreneurs have been supported. And a lot of those uh, technologies are blended really into the terrestrial industry. 
satellite application downstream ICT and space technology transfer. Uh, I cannot repeat myself enough. Just that basically gives an idea what's being generated by space. I'm not saying one should not look into stuff upstream investments and good opportunities there, but I think it's totally unknown uh, where on earth things can be done. Um, there is a couple of things which go via, via radios, uh, via trackers, uh, these type of things, all stuff which has flown on satellites. So now Outlook. And then a kind of we are done. Outlook. Tens. Um, so, yeah, before yeah. you go into the Outlook, a couple of questions emerged, and I think um, if there's an uh, opportunity for, you, for me to ask you them, uh, you know, one of the topical uh, points today is uh, climate change. And uh, do you, are you aware of any space startups that are helping? Solve climate change or facilitating the SDGs because obviously coming yes. out of this crisis, there's a lot of attention uh, in that space. Actually, yes, there are many, many of them, and um, so you you must you must understand that we have kind of um, satellite operators and constellations which provides Earth Earth observation data or remote sensing data. Um, we have a multitude of companies on the downstream kind of confectionating these data or meshing data and generating big data or kind of extracting uh, focused uh, information via automated processing, certain algorithms, et cetera, et cetera, for dedicated uh, things. So the, uh, climate, the climate change is being addressed by hundreds of companies on the planet which use satellite data and other data and uh, trying to support both the government as well as certain industries which that that are kind of preparing for contributing solutions uh, or helping uh, fight the climate change. So they're almost tracking the data and tracking signals and giving an almost an early warning signal like they're now casting, it's providing weather pattern data for yeah. pilots. Much of it is used for you know, tracking where we are on uh, hotspots that might be emerging, etc. Yeah, and there's even new co companies which kind of dump many, many satellites which come down through the atmosphere and take, me take measures of the atmosphere uh, to improve the atmospheric model uh, in a way which, which was not possible before. You know, now you can take these kind of small cube and nano micro, micro nanosats, uh, picosats even, uh, with you, and they just kind of, you throw them uh, through the atmosphere, they come down, take measures, give the data down, and you have a kind of a more precise net of data points in the, in the atmosphere for the, to support and improve the atmospheric model, which then in turn, help us to better understand the climate by itself. And what we saw over the last five years in particular, that kind of um, insights changed by the scientists changed significantly, and that was to a large extent supported by satellite, right, or by satellite-generated data, and a lot of men, a, a kind of an army of small companies on, on, on the downstream to helping kind of uh, figuring out certain information, right? So, but uh, it was, we got, may, may I just rush through the rest? Uh, and then, uh, so what I'm showing you here is, don't look into the details. Basically, it says like we have tens of thousands of satellites to come in the next couple of years. Many constellations are being uh, being uh, announced. Some are already putting up satellites like Starlink by by SpaceX. But we are in the middle is one web which just went went uh, bankrupt uh, in March. Uh, we will see whether they will make it. They have already a number of satellites up in space. But in principle, tens of thousands of satellites have been announced. And imagine if even half of them come. Um, what that by itself means as for an industry to, to, to kind of mature in commercialization, industrialization, and these stuff. In the long run, a lot of things to be done. Um, uh, what you see here is sort of a, 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 an outlook on sending stuff to space building, assembling in space, moving further, bringing stuff down, um, servicing space in space infrastructure elements, um, etc. using building blocks, industrializing things, moving, working towards serious manufacturing, and you'll just look at that. I mean, modularity, robotics, these are sort of AI, augmented reality, and these type of things are big, big technologies, like light structures, special materials, these type of things. Uh, to kind of further investigate our planets, etc., all the way to space exploration and uh, planetary resources, in a way that was the name of the company, but kind of mining resources uh, in space, right? So that would be kind of damn important. 
And uh, so this is a kind of a big move. And uh, so big topics which are driving the industry along those lines are a kind of all these kind of things, technologies which you use, and you just look at these images and uh, imagine what it takes if you have, if you really apply and implement, which is partly happening already, these uh, same parts principles like in car industry and these types of things, you know, with further reduction of launch costs, there's a huge competition in the small launcher market. We have currently 130 plus startups in the, if, with, with new rockets uh, and these types of things, huge competition, of course, not many will not make it, but what it means is like for any sector evolving, there's many people, many players, a lot of dropouts, but at the end of the day, a lot of adv adv advancement will happen. So, and that's another picture. So basically, um, that is just something for you to, to, to think about what that means uh, and where it may go. Uh, here is an image by the company Planetary Resources, which doesn't exist anymore in that way, actually, but it's kind of like mining asteroids getting to, uh, to, to special resources, uh, which are very valuable. Isn't um, that a Lydia Mandis company, Planetary Resources, uh, set up by Peter Diamandis? Uh, no, 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 no. That was there were other people involved. There were other people involved. No, no. But that was a company which then moved to or was partly partly uh, based in, in Luxembourg. Um, here is another outlook by the company Offworld, which is developing a lot of advanced robotics on Earth to use in space, to send to space, to learn for Earth, and to have them kind of like uh, uh, ruggedized uh, 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 autonomous uh, robotics, uh, robotics and rovers and these types of things. You may have heard the phrase new space ecosystem before, but what does it mean? For the Space Robotics SRC, it means building a sustainable and flexible space sector by using robotic common building blocks. This standardized approach will enable users to do more with their spacecraft, creating better efficiency savings and long-term returns, strengthening the space and the space-enabled economy. Over time, Robots will enable us to use space and the vehicles in space in innovative new ways, opening up new markets and ideas. Future applications of robots in space could be allowing satellites to service each other in orbit, or perhaps build things robotically in space, such as telescopes and mirrors. Eventually, we could see entire spacecraft made from these building blocks, meaning they could change shape, form, and function, being robotically reconfigured to suit the user's needs. Think of it as like having your own Lego kit in space, all connected using USB cables. Because once you have a universal connectivity, you can do pretty much anything. Having robots that can think and act autonomously and connect to each other to exchange data, modules, or to create a new functional form entirely means that next generation spacecraft and vehicles such as rovers will live longer, explore farther, and deliver greater returns for us. For example, Currently, satellites have to carry everything they need for the rest of their life, enough energy, power, and fuel to last a lifetime. This takes up significant amounts of onboard volume and mass, meaning less space for the tools and payloads needed for the actual mission. But with advanced robotics, satellites could be maintained and refueled by services spacecraft, meaning they can store more mission-relevant tools, hardware, and payloads to deliver greater scientific and commercial returns. Robotic services spacecraft can also ensure that, once they're finally at the end of their operational lives, satellites can be safely recycled or deorbited, leaving Earth's orbit uncluttered, safe. Just as robots are used in industry on Earth to build and assemble many of the products we use in our everyday lives, we can expect them to play a much greater role in actually building and assembling products in space. This will mean we're able to build much larger things, telescopes, space stations, and even new spacecraft that can change form and function. Together, these robotics technologies will redefine the way in which we use space and how it affects our lives back on Earth. The SRC is key to developing technologies to strengthen the European space robotics industry and plans to go from strength to strength over the next decade. So this, this video was put together by Peraspera, which is a program of Horizon 2020 by the European Commission. So there's a European understanding which subsets of the industry to drive and support uh, for the future to kind of maintain a good position in a global context and a global uh, uh, space industry and also nurse uh, kind of subsets of industry uh, in the, on the European continent. 
So, and then of course, a number of the things all the way go into these, these uh, some of those te technologies go into uh, terrestrial applications. Here, for instance, this is a project by Airbus and other and Audi, etc. So you use spaceborne technologies for intermodal transport, for instance, right? So uh, where you need kind of these technologies and we know, we all know that kind of transport and logistics um, will change big time in, in, in the next couple of years, right? Here is a startup based out of Luxembourg which is developing a, a, a utility a energy supply facility uh, which generates solar cells to do this both on the moon and on Earth. It's basically a black box where you put in sand on the one hand side and solar cells come out on the other side. It's quite interesting. Of stuff. So space-borne technologies. To wrap this up, the message here is the following. Space-related investment, the timing is getting right. Um, the timing was probably for very advanced people, also all right before, but now is a, is a, is a multitude of, of interesting commercial uh, investment opportunities arising from the space sector. Along the various lines, as I explained, upstream, big, big pocket, but supply chain, chain subsystems components on the upstream space segment um, is uh, there are sexy opportunities via industrialization, mass production, etc., etc. So all these components and new technologies um, uh, are look, looking forward to a, to, a, to a growing market, and the market is already there, and it's growing big time now. Uh, satellite application downstream ICT, that's very much blended into terrestrial industry. It's basically ICT deals uh, enabled by space data, okay? So, and then of course satellites in the play. Um, uh, and, the, and last but not least, uh, space technology transfer. I outlined a couple of these things. So here, the, my message is the following. One has to be opportunistic because the deal flow is not enough for any subset or any sort of narrow investment focus. However, if one has, and that's the that's downside for a lot of existing venture capital vehicles, is if you have a rigid VC or common VC structure, it's going to be damn difficult. Business angels are sometimes not sufficient to do the job, but a flexible system of investing uh, is ideally uh, positioned to tap into opportunities related to space. And um, so um, one has to, to bring in a, a lot of sector intelligence on the one hand side, but at the end of the day, it's straightforward uh, um, business acumen, which, which, which really uh, makes a deal successful. And that is not different in space uh, compared to, to, to other industries. So, um, and we have an enormous amount, a growing community of next gen space generation leaders. And these guys really have the power and skills to make it happen. Well, it's a totally different breed of people uh, compared to those who have left the industry so far. And uh, that is of course accelerated by the ongoing changes I explained earlier. Um, and then we get factual data, which we didn't have many years ago, right? So now we have data and we can look into things. The data are not there yet in, in, in the way we would like to have them, but we're getting there. So concluding remark, I personally believe uh, Consilient Ventures is ideally positioned, giving its model and setup and its flexibility, the liquidity of investment and the diversification of its approach to tap into space. Um, and by that would have an enormous advantage over other investors. Uh, so, so, and with that, uh, I um, I conclude my little tale. Okay. So, some questions that came up, you know, as you were chatting, uh, from Stefanos. He said, "What do you think about spaceports? Are there enough to satisfy the future commercial demand out there?" Well, that's so, a good, good question. I'm, I'm personally very skeptical. Um, at least, I cannot believe that. The, all those spaceport projects which are being promoted currently uh, um, that the market can satisfy them. So um, I think uh, we have uh, spaceport projects all over the planet. Uh, I think even in the UK or three or more, you know. So, um, and uh, my question is really whether that works. But that is another thing because launch service or space access, a launch service provider, rockets, sending stuff into space is by itself something which breaks up in different, um, uh, in different subsets because it is the uh, launch, uh, the, the, the rocket manufacturer, that is one thing. So MAIT, manufacturer and uh, uh, um, uh, uh, assembly integration testing. So MAIT, so the rocket. 
That is one business. The other business, totally distinct, is facility management, right? Which is managing the site, having the launch pad, having these type of things and these type of things. And the number three business involved in that or kind of business unit in this is launch service provider, which is the, is the logistics company. Okay, so you can see that these things are very, very different. So I personally believe um, governments may uh, support, in a way, the, 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 the launch sites, spaceports, uh, whereas all the rest and uh, has to be in, provide the infrastructure and the environment, where all the rest has to be done totally, fully commercial. But again, even that may change because we see different models over time. Okay. Um there's a question from Anne just, just popped through. Uh, in space manufacturing, to me, this seems still an area where de-risking is still required and government funding is still essential because the market isn't ready. Uh, I'd argue that some of the space robotics is still so nascent, the market isn't quite there. Um, so you mentioned uh, Off-World, which has an interesting business model that is terrestrially driven. Is that, is that right? Would you agree to those comments? Well, it is uh, the, the off-world guys, you mean? Yes. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that is a very interesting company because um, there was a precursor company which was called Hackett, uh, Hackett and Energy or something like that. Uh, so moving a bit along the same line. So inspired by space and mm -hmm. focused on, on exploiting the commercial space business with these uh, robotics and rover type of things, exploration vehicles and technologies. And they are so realistic that they realize, okay, that is going to come, uh, but we can use part of the space technology to, uh, um, to enhance robotics on Earth. And then kind of with this going back and forth and back and forth, we have a learning process so that as the time, as the market matures, we are there with the best technologies and can start over big time. And do you think a government has a role in this? Do you think that because it's so early stage that their uh, involvement is mandatory at this stage? Yes and no. Yes and no. I think the governments are doing, the governments are currently in, in, in a learning process, right? So it's a, it's a changing environment for them. Um, with regards to, to space commercialization, most of the governments are not up to the task, okay? Uh, same applies for the space agencies. Having said that, it's not to criticize the space agencies. The question is, what is their role? If they pave the way to, on the one hand side, to, to, to continue uh, scientific exploitation and R&D and support uh, the basis of, te of technology development, I think that makes a lot of sense. The question is whether uh, agencies and governments can really, um, apart from maybe uh, improving a few boundary conditions, whether they can really play a role. I personally don't think so. And uh, the past has shown they can't, okay? So, uh, but, but that is a, that's a different discussion. I mean, some governments doing pretty well because Luxembourg built a totally new model, they have a space agency, the space agency is not doing any product, project, not doing anything in space. What they're doing is they're trying to set up an environment which attracts space companies to Luxembourg. It's a different mission. Right, so that is, uh, that's maybe one of them. Final question from Anna. Um, do you, which are the downstream applications uh, do you think uh, are, uh, are yet still full of potential and not yet saturated? Yeah, so I think um, yes and no. It really, it, there is no general answer to this because the satellite application downstream ICT business, as I, as I, I, I like to name it, is um, is so diverse. You have to look into subsets, into the market, into the applications, you know? So um, I think there is still a, a lot to be exploited. People say, hey, and navigation, that is already uh, uh, satnav, that is already everywhere, etc., etc." No, it is not in some subsets. And uh, the same applies for Earth observation, remote sensing, same applies for satellite telecommunications and these integrated applications, which combine three of those, two or three of those generic satellite applications. You know, so I think there is no clear answer to this. And as I tried to point out earlier, um, the sector is not yet understood uh, to the extent as other industries are being understood from the commercialization, market development, and investment perspective. Okay, so that requires an opportunistic view on the one hand side and a flexible approach. And we don't know in some subsets of markets. 
facts. And the examples are the history given by history of space. Um, there was in the 1980s uh, and the 1990s, one, uh, in the 1980s, people were looking into microgravity research. It did not really, um, um, it did not really is, is, um, materialize, right? And then people were looking into hypersonic space transportation going to uh, New York, Tokyo in one and a half hours. No, it did not materialize, right? Space tourism was promoted again at the beginning of last decade. It's still not there yet, but it's about coming. Once it comes, it's a market, it will grow, but it's not gonna be a mega, mega, mega market, but the market itself is probably gonna be pretty sexy and uh, has uh, will, will spread the flare of space and attract more people to the sector. Okay, so that kind of thing. So the answer is yes and no. We have to look into the deals and the, and the market segments in different market segments. Otherwise, it would be uh, uh, would be not smart to to give a general statement in my view. And as far uh, one comment uh, lastly on on ESA, you know, ESA is in a transition process and doing is so far doing an immense, a tremendous job. You know, it's pretty good. But in Europe, we have also other things, political plays. You know, the European Commission is gaining more influence, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's another a totally different thing. I think space agencies, ESA is a multinational body. Um, and it's focused on these things. Uh, they have set some policy guidelines and a couple of things supporting many things, but their ESA business as of today, the way it arrives in the industry is not the commercialization. Uh, I just want to close out by thanking you for putting together an excellent presentation, sharing his views and wisdom, coming on to uh, the program. Uh, thank you all for uh, giving up your uh, lunch hour and uh, I certainly feel more educated about space. I hope you do.